The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our first presentation is behind the aluminum skin of the Wiley Theater. Uh, we're, we're lucky today. We actually have uh, two presenters. One is uh, Jeff Wagner, and the second one will be Chris Arpea. They're both with McCarthy Building Company. They were both on this project from the very beginning. Jeff Wagner was the project manager, and Chris Arpea was his superintendent uh, in this project. So uh, without further ado, please help me welcome uh, Chris Arpea. Welcome. I'll be presenting today with Jeff on what happened behind, underneath the skin of this building. We're going to do a little different approach and try and tell you why the building was uh, special to put up. I'll be punching out a lot of facts at you and moving slides along. I think we got about a total of 99 slides, so you won't ever be bored because they'll be flipping by quick. And then uh, we'll, we'll bring up Jeff for some entertainment because he can tell a yarn like nobody I know, so that'll help a lot. Rex OMA, in conjunction with Joshua Prince Ramos in uh, New York, designed this building, and what they were looking for in the Arts District was something that would offset the massiveness of the Foster-designed Winspear Opera House next door. The Dallas Theater Center was looking for a new home, they knew they didn't want anything more than about a 600-seat theater, so the uh, design team of Rex OMA came up with the idea of a vertical theater, which had never been done, basically something that would rise up 135 feet tall and literally be a stacked theater. So what you're looking at is down below, three stories below the ground are mechanical rooms, actors and actresses' dressing rooms. Then you get to the main theater center, which is right in here with a, with a the gallery going up at the top. You've got dressing or uh, dance studios. Up, up in this area right here is a fabric center where they can make things. There's an outside porch. So in other words, they just built this giant vertical theater. The theater equipment inside was kind of special. The inside of the theater has seating on the sides, the south side and the east and the west sides that basically rise on scoreboard hoists up into the ceiling. The theater itself is a glass box on all four sides, which no theater ever does because you want it dark inside. The glass walls rise up, they have shades that come down, you have scoreboard seating that can rise up and hide in the ceiling. You have ten lifts in the floor that can create angled floors, proscenium floors, the stage can move up and down, or you can just make a flat floor configuration in the theater so they can open it up for parties or entertaining inside. Very, very unique, but we're not going to really talk about that today. I would recommend, if you have time, though, to go down, bother Alex Hargis at the theater, and he'll show you what it's all about inside. It's, it's quite interesting. The picture on the left is the actual sewing room up top, giving you an idea of some of the different lighting. The picture on the right is the conference room below the offices, and that's the carpeted 10th floor outdoor room, kind of a smoking area off the dance. They, they use it right now mainly for entertaining the actors and actresses when they put on shows up top. Very different building, very contemporary. 
we want to talk about the photo on the left today. And what the photo on the left shows are battered and vertical concrete columns that are 18 inches by 4 foot. They rise 135 feet up into the air with structural steel all laced in between them. On top of that, when dens board, dens glass board, with a Carlisle waterproofing and then an elastomer coating on the outside that got covered with tubes that were made in Argentina. The tubes which were extruded in Argentina were meant to look like a drape, um, a hanging drape on the outside of the building. So last photo you can see the, the tubes hanging on the outside of the building. But, like I said, we're going to talk about what's underneath those tubes on the building. First we'll talk a little bit about our subgrade work. Really not a whole lot different for what happens in Dallas. On the bottom right, Craig Olden Company came in, did shotcrete with tiebacks. You can see them drilling in the bottom right hand corner. And then when we started coming out of the ground, we we're using basically a gang form system with A bracing coming back because it was all a dead pour. You can see from the top of the photo that we're about 35, 40 feet below the ground. There were some manholes that went down another 25 feet below that for sumps, etc. What you see right in the middle of the photo is the orchestra pit, where the orchestra pit lift would come down from the main stage. And on the left-hand side of the photo at the top is one of the columns that comes up all the way rising 135 feet above the ground. Again, pretty straightforward construction. The concrete was basically all 5,000 PSI concrete at this level. When we got up a little bit higher, the main slab that supported the audience chamber of the building was composed of some very, very large concrete beams because the whole building, which was a 100 by 100 foot footprint, had no interior columns, nothing inside. So everything had a span across the hole. One of the unique things the architect did was he created inside the beams what they, what they call in theater speak vomitories, which are access ways. The actors can run down the vomitories and pop up into the audience by running through the beams underneath the, uh, the main slab. The, the bottom right photo is uh, blue, we called it Smurf tubing, but baby, basically it's uh, blue carbon flex tubing and what we had to do was because there were so many electrical runs in the main floor for sound and whatever other needs we had, we had to run them just massive quantities of this blue tubing and the structural engineer insisted that we keep them spaced at six or nine inches, whatever it was, and when we crossed we had to do it a certain way. And to use rigid conduit seemed prohibitive because they made so many turns and ganged in certain boxes. So you can kind of see what we were going through trying to run this Smurf tubing all over through the slabs to get it where it needed to go. Is that a old tension tubing or is that sort of you're giving you? Nope, that's, it's just plain old structural concrete, rebar and concrete, there's no post tensioning. Smurf tubing. Oh, no, it's electrical conduit. It's electrical conduit, yeah. So we'll talk a little bit now about the shear wall and the columns. So basically, there's two columns per side on the building. So there's two columns on the north side, two columns on the west side, two columns on the south side, and then a shear wall, which would carry the elevators on the east side of the building. We had a challenge right up front on how to make these things rise up to the top. So basically looking at this set of documents, right here you're looking at the north side of the building and then it folds and you're looking at the west side of the building, the south side of the building, and then the shear wall on the east side of the building. So you can see these columns that rose from ground level up to 135 feet above the ground. Again, they're 18 inches by 4 feet. 8,000 PSI concrete, and you're talking about a lot of rebar that goes inside of these, and we have to pour them on a batter. The batters range from 63 degrees to 57 degrees. They intersected, 
and they all had to meet at the top on certain corners, and then again in some corners they splayed away at the top. The shear wall was a 12-inch concrete wall that rose all the way up to the top, and basically the elevators rode right on that shear wall exterior to the building. Early on, we had to make some decisions where we were going to go. As we were coming out of the ground, we had decided we were going to use shoring towers. And we were going to use decks and shoring towers with gang forms to construct this. And around the outside of the building, initially, we built this pad. So the foundation is in here. And on the outside of the building, this concrete pad is strictly for the shoring towers to sit on that are going to support the columns and the shear wall going up. So to get your perspective, this is the north side of the building, and this is the shear wall over here on the east side of the building. We constructed the whole job with our Manitowoc 3900 crane. We didn't see a good spot to put a tower crane. The crane ended up working out fine in the long run as it walked around the building to do the erection. This gives you an idea at the ground level when we formed the first col uh, column what our plan was. Basically, it's just a job-built gang form, bracing on the outside. We form the interior and the exterior of the tops of the column, and then close it up on the other side, and there you go. So there's a vertical column poured there and a battered column coming up. This gives you a little bit of a taste for what happens next. So you have your bottom columns poured, then we build the shoring up, build a deck, and then set the gang again on top of the deck and start going up again with the concrete columns. So the rebar was all cut and sent out to come up in lifts, and then we would pour the column. The shear wall, pretty much the same, except that we used a jump form system. You can see the trailing legs coming down the wall, and basically as the scaffolding came up, we kept pace with it coming up, the shear wall with the concrete pours on the shear wall. The steel you see on the outside is actually part of the building. The elevators ride exterior to the building. It's a, there are steel boxes that ride on the outside of the building. It was something the architect wanted to see. He didn't want the elevators in, encased. Challenges when you're building like this. One of our biggest challenges was the embeds for the structural steel. There's 820 tons of structural steel in the building. So you've got 8,000 PSI slender concrete columns that all the structural steel of the building attaches to. First thing we did was we built a mock-up down on the ground because the engineer told us, well, this 6,200 pound embed cannot sit on the column that you just poured. So what we did was just using shoring materials that we had, we decided that the, the wood deck that we were building in the shoring scaffold, we would make steel plates, bring them down and create shoring legs on either side of the embed to transfer the load of the embed to our shoring tower so that it would hover above the top of the concrete column. And then what we did was we had the structural engineer come out as we used our mock-up to determine what modifications had to be done to all the number 11 bars coming through because on this embed are numerous, you can see them, Nelson studs protruding out. Also, inside these columns on the faces were numerous embeds in the other plane that had to be set in the right location for welding of steel that came in. The other thing that was very critical was there were 40 to 50 bolt holes for steel that had to match up with this embed plate as we went up. So alignment was critical. So think about it, you got a battered column coming 135 feet in the air and at different intervals coming up you've got these embeds that are going to grab onto a 32 foot tall belt truss that wraps around the building and you're supposed to get every anchor bolt in the right place. We managed it, though. You can see over here, there's an embed, and there's an embed with a piece of structural steel made it up between, and there's embeds sticking out at the top. And actually, this one up here, you can see right here in a blow-up, 
There's the legs on the side holding it. There's the Nelson studs. and The steel gets a little tight here and there. That's without the stirrups in it, but basically the overall picture shows it and it works. Another thing we had to do was we had to marry up as we erected the columns some of the structural steel to the column as we went up. It not only helped support the column on the way up, but more important, I don't think we could have got it in if we didn't go on the way up. One interesting fact that we're all kind of proud of, you see the number of bolt holes on either side. When Bosworth Steel erected this structural steel on this structure, they did not put a torch to one bolt hole in erection of the concrete steel. Every member lined up perfectly. Right there is one of those small embeds I was saying we had to get in the other planes. So when you're pouring battered columns and you're trying to do 20 foot plus lifts, we realized with all the embeds inside, all the structural steel inside and the stirrups, there wasn't really much of a chance to put a vibrator down in and pour the concrete with a pump truck or a crane from the top. So what we elected to do was use bottom pumping on the walls and the columns. You can see you hook up right at the bottom. When you bottom pump, basically you bring the air up, you go nice and slow, you don't have to put a vibrator in, your finish comes out perfect every time. It was very successful for us. How's it stay up? And when we say that, basically, when you're erecting something like this, think about it, you're putting battered columns up. How are they staying up while you're pouring? Because you're on a schedule. You don't want to wait for concrete to cure to 8,000 PSI or even 75%. You want to keep going as fast as you can. Early on, we realized that if we were going to work and keep the forms moving, we wanted to strip the forms as fast as possible. One thing we elected to do was inside the gang forms, put Ellis shores inside the column to the faces. So if you look over in this picture, you see the gang form, and you can see before we close the outside face, against the bottom of the formwork, we put the Ellis shores in so that the column has internal supporting all the way down to the shoring deck. And when we elected to strip the outside forms, sometimes as soon as 24 hours, the column was supported, and the structural engineer couldn't be looking at us and saying, hey, guys, my column's going to droop, especially if it had a 6,000-pound embed on the top of it. Another problem was the shear wall, because the shear wall also rose up 135 feet. We had to find a way to, for wind loading on that wall so that that wall wouldn't be rocking and rolling on us. These exterior steel, the exterior steel right here that you see going up, is the steel that's permanent for the elevator cars to ride on. So we asked the structural engineers, there's somehow we can erect the structural steel with the concrete lifts as we pour with the jump forms to the top so that it becomes a wind brace. So he told us, well, if you weld in a bunch of gussets in the corner and you add these diagonals in, I think it'll hold that wall up in a whatever kind of wind gust was going to come along. And it worked out well. Again, we were able to go right up to the top with no problems there. Basically, what you're looking at is we're headed towards the top. There were over 225 shoring frames in this building. At this point, they're about 90 feet above the ground, and you get an idea what's going on as far as the deck. So this column's right here. There was a deck for pouring this lift to here. And then when you got to here, there's another deck to pour the next lifts. And you see how the decks stagger out as the columns go out. Again, you can see we married in some steel to transfer some load down. Again, you can see the size of the embed sticking out of the top of the columns. There's just another shot of it. We'll talk about a little more temporary supports, but you can see right here a temporary structural steel that goes way down to the corner to help distribute some of this load coming down. And again, another shot with the shoring frames can actually get a pretty good look over here of the bracing on the outside of the elevator shaft and the shear wall. Threw this shot in to kind of give you a little tickler, but this is basically the shear wall to the top, the belt truss, which rises 32 feet top on the north side, 
And you see the idea of the slender columns coming up, a column on the south side, the intersecting column on the west side, and then the, the tall column over here. These, all this steel had to be laced into the shoring towers as we went up. To do something like this, you need to put together quite a plan. And what we decided to do was enlist our own structural engineer to do it. Jeff, I'd love it if you would come up and talk to the... I'm Jeff Wagner. I was a project manager on the job. I was really fortunate to have Chris because Chris is a civil engineer as well. And he kind of um, didn't really get into a lot of the intricate details of what went into this, but I'll touch on them a little bit. Magnuson Clemensic was the engineer of record. Magnuson Clemensic told McCarthy early on in the job, we're not going to tell you how to do this, nor are we going to tell you whether or not the building will stand up while you build it. So we had done some uh, cable stay bridges before, and we had worked with T.Y. Lynn International. With that relationship with T.Y. Lynn, we decided to hire them to be our construction engineer to work with McCarthy in developing a construction sequence that would uh, generate a structure that wouldn't collapse, number one, which was a huge fear of the CEO of McCarthy who would call us every week and ask us about the job. It was a big concern of the engineers as well. So T.Y. Lynn worked with us over a six-month period in developing a staged analysis, and we came up with a plan that had 87 steps. That was a 22-staged analysis uh, structural review by T.Y. Lynn, and we did that in collaboration with Magnus and Clemensic, and it was, it was challenging at times. We had guys that were really egocentric, that were really button heads. I mean, we had some excellent, excellent players Jay Taylor from Magnuson Clemensic, David Goodyear from T.Y. Lynn. David was the engineer record for the dam, the bridge over Black Rock Canyon, below Hoover Dam. Jay Taylor's in ENR all the time. You know, ENR for me was like the Rolling Stone for us. I mean, that was like the thing when we were in college, you know, reading the ENR and thinking about the jobs that you saw in there and then Fortunately for us, we made the cover of the NR twice for this job, this little bitty job in Dallas that a lot of people would drive by and say, you know, it looks like you're building a 7-Eleven or something. What's taking so long? But I will tell you that it took a lot of collaboration and a lot of effort and many, many meetings. This building ended up winning a lot of awards, one of which was the AISC Steel Erection Award for the year for the United States. And uh, John Bosworth was at the ceremony with me, and he said, you know, I want to tell you this job was only 850 tons of steel, but I, I think we had one meeting for every ton coordinating how to build it. So it was, a, it was a challenging thing to do. A great deal of intense collaboration and meeting time was spent. We ended up flying to Olympia and Seattle, Washington, on numerous occasions going through computer analysis. And Magnuson was concerned about whether or not the way we built this thing would collapse the permanent members. One of the main elements of the job that you wonder, why, why so much attention to the columns? How come you're going to all this effort to get them so straight? Well, they're exposed as architecture in the building. When you go in, this, in the structure, in the building now, it is a structure. So structure is a big element of the architecture. One of the early things that the design team came to us with was we don't want any chamfer in any of the, any of the concrete columns. No chamfer in the walls. No chamfer in the columns. No chamfer in the pilasters. How are we going to do it? You can't patch or rub any of the concrete. No rock pockets. No patching. And Chris did it. And the way that we figured out to do it was the bottom pumping. When you would see the mass of reinforcing and Nelson studs and embeds, there was physically no way to get concrete in the formwork. It was impossible. So the bottom pumping was, it was just, it was crucial to that. So we had to get, develop with Leo. We developed a 3 8 mix, an 8,000 PSI 3 8 mix with plasticizers in it that we could bottom pump. And the, co and the columns came out beautiful. Crisp corners to this day. No patching had to be done. Another thing that was interesting that maybe Chris didn't point out to you was that elevator shear wall is, is the exterior of the building. It has to be waterproof. Kim, waterproofing. I, is anybody, was anybody involved in this job in any manner? Has anybody used Kim waterproofing before? You have? 
So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's felt a little hokey at times. You put it in, you know, TXI put it in at the plant, and then we had to pile it up on the cold joints in between lifts, but it worked. Bottom line was it works. Every time it rains, water doesn't come inside the building. You know, we were terrified about that. Another huge thing with our quality program and our quality directors and our CEOs, is this concrete really going to keep water out of the building? It worked. Fantastic. We had probably, yeah, we probably did have 85 meetings on this job about how to do the erection. A lot of the elements of the structure had to be increased in size just to withstand the construction loading. We ended up, when you look at the building, there is no perimeter, there's no columns in the corner. So what you're seeing over here is a temporary column. And what you're seeing right here, this is a temporary pair of columns that support this concrete column until the entire structure is completed. There's another temporary column here. So there's no corner columns. There's no interior columns. All you have are these slender 18-inch by 48-inch battered columns and then this 34-foot deep belt truss. And so this structure, the, the hardest thing about this job was this structure is unstable until it's, the entire building was completed. We had to have every floor installed, all the concrete cured out. And when that was completed, oh, here's our staged erection procedure. Shear wall, columns. Basically what you're looking at is this is the computer model of the analysis of each structure with the construction loads on it. And this is how we had to build it. What you'll see is the columns come up and the bottom of the belt truss is at level four. The top of the belt truss is at level seven. That's a 10 level building, actually 11 with the roof. And we had uh, two floors that hung on hangers from below the belt truss. And then we had three floors that posted up off the top of the belt truss. All those floors had to be poured and cured out to design strength. And then the very top of the structure, that roof up there that you see right here, that served as a tension element from this corner right here back to that shear wall. So they had a bunch of rebar in there to act as like a big cable to tie that thing back to keep this corner of the building right here from coming down dramatically. It was designed to come down three, three fourths of an inch. And we calculated that this corner would come down a half inch when we removed this temporary column right here. And it actually came down seven sixteenths of an inch. We were all wondering how much noise it was going to make and how exciting it was going to be. We had everybody and their brother here. Ian R was here. Magnus and Clemensic had four people here. T.Y. Lynn had three. Uh, McCarthy had way too many people here from headquarters, but it worked out. So bottom line was, you know, at times I felt like way too many meetings. Gosh, there were so many meetings, but it paid off tenfold in the end. And the biggest thing, you can see the columns coming out right here. And the way the columns came out, are you going to get into that? I'll let Chris tell you about it. But basically, we jacked this building up and pulled the columns out from under it. Anytime you do anything of really significant heavy loads, there's no way to pick it up. You've got a jacket. So anybody that's done any heavy bridge work or heavy duty construction, industrial construction, you'll, you get into jacking. In the end, you know, the, one of the great things about this job was, uh, that we all had to really collaborate. The design team accredited McCarthy as one of the design team members because so much of this job was design build. And so Chris talked about the seating towers. I mean, the seating towers are 60 tons each. There's three of them. And there's hoists, that, similar to scoreboard hoists, only heavier, that lift those seating towers up out of the space to make a flat floor. And can you remember the day we were trying to drift those down into place, Chris? Chris is talking on his phone. I'm like, Chris, we. it's amazing how easy it is to move a heavy load in the air. For those of you that have done any, worked in the trades or, or been a rigger before, you can push a 60 ton of load around pretty easy, can't you, Chris? Chris is on the phone. No, no, it's fine. I'm like, 
You got to watch that corner for me, buddy. It's coming down. We're letting this thing down for all the finishes that are going on. All of a sudden, there it goes through the floor, Chris. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll fix that tomorrow. Anyway, with the, without somebody like Chris being a civil engineer, you know, on the job, I don't know how we would have managed this. So many things where we had Magnus and Clemensic, T.Y. Lynn, McCarthy sitting in the room, Bosworth Steel Erectors, John Bosworth, all of us collaborating, all of us structural engineers for the most part. I'm a structural engineer from Iowa State. Chris is a civil engineer, UConn. You know, all this heavy-duty engineering firepower. What are we going to do about these embeds? Chris is like, I got it. Don't worry about it. I got it. We're just going to make some braces with some screw jacks on the bottom and just screw them up above, you know. Pretty simple when you think about it, but I'll tell you what, guys like Magnuson and T.Y. Lynn were going, man, I, I, I really didn't have a solution for that till you came up with it. So great job from that perspective. A lot of great relationships formed from this to this day. Taking all my thunder. The center of the building had two large trusses that ran through the middle. And basically these trusses were 32 feet tall and we had to build them down on the ground. So you can see we utilized our mud mat that we put up for the shoring towers to put down dunnage and start building these trusses that go in the middle of the building down on the ground. Then we had to use a two crane pick, you see one on each side, and fit these things in between the shear wall and the column, the battered column, Jeff was alluding to the supports, the temporary dual support that we had on the west side. That support had a drilled pier down underneath it. And it was all there because we knew when we loaded this massive truss that was 32 feet from the highest point to the lowest point, 32 feet high. We made two picks out of it, by the way. You see there's only the bottom half going in here. Then we set the top half on top of it. But we would load up that column where we loaded that slender column. We had to have that temporary brace. This shot basically shows you the exterior truss and then the interior, the top of the interior trusses as they're going in. There's the two temporary columns coming down on the outside that are supporting those trusses up at the top. Jeff also alluded to the temporary support. So... Everywhere in the building as we went up, and he might have noticed when he flew through that engineer's uh, plan that, that showed us where our critical points were, we had to put bracing. As we came up, every column had to have a green 12-inch steel tube wind brace coming back. Over here you can see the wind braces coming back. Now, if you think about it, what made the wind braces difficult? Well, they wanted the wind braces installed when we got to this elevation of the pour. We had 225 shoring towers in there. And everybody said, gosh, how are you going to do that? So what we would do was we rigged the 12-inch tubes in a vertical configuration with chain hoists. We would drop them down vertically against the column, and then we would remove the X bracing and pull it back a little at a time using the chain falls until we drifted the base of the 12-inch tube back through as we replaced the bracing through. So we would do this every time we got done at night. We'd send everybody home, and then some of us crazy people would go outside and start taking shoring apart and drift in the wind braces into the scaffolding. And when the crews would come back in the morning, all the braces would be inside of the wall, the shoring towers. Those were wind braces. On the corner, Jeff alluded to this structural steel member, which is temporary support here on the corners. This is the wide open corner. This was the corner that gave everybody so much agita. Is it going to stay up? Is the building going to fall down? Because... All the floors above elevation four at this point, all that load is coming to that corner. This is at the bottom where this column comes down. We have structural steel on the concrete. Then we had jacks inside so that we could take it down and drift that piece out at the end. So again, shots, you can see the wind bracing coming in. 
You can see the scaffolding while it was still in place. So we were putting in these wind braces while the scaffolding was here. There's your X bracing on the walls. Here's another good shot. This battered column as it went up, the architect decided that not only did it need a wind brace, but he wanted a temporary vertical brace underneath because of the load that was being imparted on this. Now we did, we're able to put one temporary piece of structural steel up here, but he didn't deem that enough, so he wanted us to add this in. This is another one that I had to drift into all the shoring towers on the way up. I think basically that's just showing you the back side, another, another vertical brace there. There are the double support towers coming through on the other side, another corner brace on this side. So you can see as we went up, the building was not open all the way around. All four corners had temporary braces coming back. Part of the structural review told us that everybody knows when you build a building, you build the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, the fourth floor. Oh no, guys, they said you can't do that. We need to start with floor number seven. After the belt trusses were in place, floor number seven was up here. Well, we were very lucky to have a, a pretty sharp guy for Bosworth Steel working for us, and Sammy Rojas said to us, hey guys, why don't you let me Christmas tree all the catwalks and all the lower steel that goes in the audience chamber and above the gridiron while we're welding out all the steel up above. Sammy, while all this steel final welding was happening up top, he dropped in all this steel down below through all the, the members. Then he decked level four, and then he came back and decked level seven, and that's where we started pouring concrete. You can see that as soon as we had that metal deck down, we wasted no time in getting our shear wall going up again at the elevators. So that gives you a pretty good shot of all the steel hanging down below, the decks going up above. There's a great shot of this double temporary column we had to put in to support the interior belt truss. That's how much load was on there. And again, some of these tubes coming back are the temporary tubes. So we have just temporary steel all over the place inside of this building. These are stairs going up. And one thing we couldn't do right away was put a buck hoist in. So everybody climbed seven to ten stories every day on this job. We poured level seven. We poured level four. We poured level five. Then we poured level six. While we're doing metal deck and pouring those slabs, we're up on the roof and we're going again with columns up on the top. So while we're pouring these decks down below, because we poured seven first, we're able to bring the shear wall up to ten and start again on our slender columns coming up to the top. Again at the bottom, you can see the temporary steel, the temporary steel, and all the corners. This is basically Bosworth Steel working right along with us. There's the vertical column on the north side. There's the shear wall. There's structural steel popping down on the deck as fast as they could put it in. There's the Wiley Theater had their little party. They had a little topping out party early on us, but that's all right. They wanted to put a beam up. This is the top of the A-frame on the south side. I really like this picture. It's a great shot of these temporary Ellis shores. So you can see we left the formwork in underneath the backside. The Ellis shores are posting that beam up on the outside. So these guys, when they're working up here, they're, they're 135 feet with a straight drop off the backside. You puckered up a little bit when you went out there and you worked. Again, level seven. This was a very, very interesting point. We had to bring this battered column up on this side, and we had to bring the battered column up on this side, and they had to meet at the top. We'd basically been working blind all the way to the top. There was no way to see what we were going to do until we got up there. And I don't know. It seemed to work out all right. <laughs> we made it work at the top. Once we're up to the top, now they want us to pour level 10 first, 
and then come back and pour levels eight and nine. Again, similar to below. So 10 was critical because of what Jeff was alluding to, all the structural steel that came back on the top of this deck. One of the interesting things when you do something like this is if you've worked with any kind of metal pan deck when you're pouring concrete, you know that that metal pan wants to deflect. Embracing the metal pan when you're working seven stories above the ground or ten stories above the ground becomes a challenge. But we, we found ways to get scaffolding in and get that brace to minimize the deflection in the deck because you don't want to overload or put too much weight on that concrete deck. Obviously, you get all that concrete up, now it's time to take out all that temporary bracing and see if it stays up. You can see they're up here burning out one of the temporary columns right here. Basically, yeah, this was all. We were, we were able to do quite a bit of removal to, before the big day came when we took the corners out. But it gives you, this is a good picture, it gives you an idea, all the steel suspended down. This is actually the audience chamber on the north side. These are the catwalks above the people where the people sit. And then behind the catwalks, the space is where the seating towers, the seating towers sit on the floor down here and they suck up behind in these annular spaces behind. You don't really see them in that picture, but... This was, I guess, the big moment when we took out the corner column. You can see this column coming out right here. It was sitting right in the corner. And that, that was the big day when the, uh, everybody was on site. And that's what it looked like when we pull all the temporary steel out. So, basically you can see no more double columns here supporting. No more wind braces coming off. No more corner steel. It gives you an idea how airy it is down below there. It needed to be airy because all the way around the building are glass walls. That's what they wanted, the entire building to be glass. So when you go down there, it's glass all the way around the audience chamber with shades that, that turn it into a dark room for during the day. But uh, overall, very successful. Um, is anybody familiar with Dungeon Jacks? Dudgeon's a company in Bridgeport. They they special at Bridgeport, Connecticut. They specialize in super heavy duty jacks that can just about push on anything. And that's what that's what those columns were set on. So what we did was we stacked shims in over our steel and shim these columns way up. And then what we would do is take the shims out, slide the dudgeon jack in, and then slowly take the pressure off. Oh, they were huge. They were huge. about five minutes, so I'm going to ask if there's any questions, but I think that's that's pretty much it. I, I take it you guys don't have to worry about earthquakes out here? Okay. There's, I, if it's earthquake designed, it's, I didn't see it. That's, that's insane. Just put pressure on that, push it up like that, causes the fills. But you can see. Well, you, you have to design your hydraulic head for the full head. So, if you, you know, you can't say, oh, it's five uh, feet per, per right, square feet per man hour. You, you have to, if you've got a 20 feet form, you design it for 20 feet. Because you don't know some crazy guy might just blow it all in there quick. But the whole idea behind bottom pumping is. You're putting a hose in at the bottom of the form, and you're pumping slowly. And when you bring that that mix up, it just brings all the air with it. You, I, was, I went back to this photo. You can see, I mean, the concrete columns, we didn't touch them. We didn't rub them or anything. They just came out fantastic. Um, the columns that have these pumps, 
They, had, they were about 20 foot lifts. Some were shorter. Um, whenever we had a large embed, we were looking for that three stone digs at the end that we only need like a two or three foot lift because we visually wanted to verify that everything else inside, every stirrup, everything got concrete around it because it was so congested. We didn't want to take a chance. If we stripped the form and there was a rock pocket, we knew we were ripping it out. So we, we did the embeds and short lifts, but then we did pretty tall lifts in between. 